doing that. Well, I get the opportunity today, the privilege to introduce, we have a guest uh, speaker, a family with us. Maybe you saw them in the foyer as you came in. We have the Berkeys with us who are missionaries from two the people of Kenya, and uh, I'm so grateful to have uh, Scott and his wife, and, and I've known, I've gotten to know them uh, about eh, 10, 12 years ago. I, I first met Scott. He was a, a huge blessing to me in a role that I served in in children's and youth ministry, and uh, God has been using them now, and uh, it's kind of a children's ministry theme this morning, but God has been taking us on a journey these last few weeks of thankfulness and generosity and contentment, and I'm so thankful for what God is going to share through them as they share what God is doing in their lives and how he can use us to do more for the kingdom. Would you join me in giving a warm crosswalk welcome today to Pastor Scott and Sarah Berkey. Buenas afiwe. That means praise the Lord, so you just respond with amen. Buenas asafiwe. Buenas yesu asafiwe. That means praise the Lord Jesus. Bwana Yesu asifiwe. Amen. Nimeyakoka na mpenda Yesu. I'm saved. Oh, that's and the I... one I didn't know last service either. What is it? <laughs> Say it again. Nimeyakoka. I am saved. Na mpenda Yesu. And I love Jesus. <laughs> Asante viongozi na wachungaji ya Th kanisa. Thank you, pastor and leaders, for having us in the Mi church. Mimi ni missionary na KAG kwa next gen. I'm a missionary with the next gen with the Kenyan Assemblies of God. Mimi na familiangu tunafurahia kuishi Kenya. My family and I are happy to be in Kenya. Pole sana. I'm sorry. Nina ongea pole pole kwa sababu nina jifunza Kiswahili. I am talking very slowly because I am learning Kiswahili. And because all of you would like to make it out today, I will switch to English now. Is that all right? And also, I don't know anymore. <laughs> we are learning. We are learning a lot about Kenya's culture uh, and just all that God is doing. Uh, I'd love to just allow my wife, Sarah, we've been married for almost 23 years now. I'd love for her just to introduce you to our children before she gets to go to Kids Church and be back there with uh, Ashley and Pastor Levi and the team uh, to talk to your boys and girls uh, this morning about what God is doing in Kenya as well. But if she'll introduce our children to you first. We have three children. We brought two of them with us today. Maya and Mason, if you guys can just stand up and wave at everybody. <laughs> Maya is our middleest daughter. She said we have an oldest and a youngest. I'm going to be the middleest. And she has just turned 16, so got to have her 16th birthday here in the States. Mason has, is about to turn 14. He's 13 in eighth grade and got to play American football for the first and only time this year. But he got to play, and so that was a lot of fun. And then we have one more daughter. She's right in the middle of that photo, Madeline. She is a freshman at Trinity Bible College in Ellendale, North Dakota. And this is our very first northern winter as a family. And so we what will... What are earmuffs? We will see how we survive. Praise God. Thank you, Sarah. She's going she's gonna to go. But before she does, one of the things we, I told you we are learning culture, we're learning language. One of the things that we have learned in the Kenyan culture specifically, and I will be honest, we learned this the hard way. One of my close friends, he pulled me aside after I had been in his home a few times, and he said, Missionary Scott, you need to know that every time you go into someone's home, you should always come bearing gifts. And so today we have brought a gift for your pastor, Pastor Gabe and Tammy, just a small token of our appreciation to allow us to be here. This is a Maasai shuka, uh, and the, in the, the Maasai community, and Maasai is one of the tribes in Kenya, in the Maasai community, this is the, si uh, the sign of the highest honor when you gift someone a shuka. And this shuka was actually gifted to us when we had the opportunity to speak in one of our Kenya Assemblies of God Maasai churches. And so, Pastor, we wanted you and your wife to have that as a small token of our appreciation. Um, I know that you've spent lots of time in the South. That won't cut it here. Um, you'll need something a little bit more substantial, um, but it will at least be a start. It'll, it'll take a little bit of the chill out of the air. It is an honor to be here with you today, church, and just to have this, this incredible time. Uh, I thought this morning as I began, I would share just a little bit of our story and who we are and how we landed in Kenya on the continent of Africa. Uh, my wife and I graduated from Bible College. We went to Central Bible College in Springfield, Missouri, 
And when we graduated, we about two weeks before graduation, we started talking with each other. I was a children's ministry major, as Pastor David said. Uh, I was uh, involved in children's ministry, really our whole ministry life up until missions. And even now in missions, we're still doing um, ministry with the next generation. And it was crazy because I went to my wife and I told her, I said, listen, you need to know this. If we're really going to be serious in this relationship, you need to know that I will never be a missionary. She was a missions major in college, and all of those missions majors, they made it a point. They didn't date anyone or talk to anyone even that, they, that weren't other missions majors. And she had been called to mission field at 11 years old, and so she was determined to be a missionary. So she took this matter to prayer, and she prayed, and she said, God, is he the one? He's not going to be a missionary. He's telling me he'll never be a missionary. And God told her very clearly, don't put me in a box. I have a plan. And so she prayed and she fasted for several years. And we came to a point. We started in ministry. I was on staff at a church in Orlando, Florida for a little bit. And then we went uh, as a married couple. We went to Charleston, South Carolina and spent six and a half years in Charleston, South Carolina as children's pastors. Then we moved to Texas. And we lived in the North Dallas area in the little community called Frisco. And we watched as God used us there, and we were able to just be tools in the kingdom where we, when we arrived in Frisco, there were around 200 children in the children's ministry. I remember the day when my pastor was introducing me as the new kids pastor there. And then four years later, we looked out at 750 kids in our children's ministry. Um, so you guys, this is an opportunity to get behind Pastor Levi and the team there that is developing. And I believe those of you that are already on the team, stay on the team, buy into the vision, get involved. And those of you who aren't on the team yet, go to Serve 101 this afternoon. I mean, well, you don't have any of uh, the first service. They could be like, oh, well, we'll have to go and then come back. You guys have no excuses. You can, you can literally walk out into the meeting from this service. And all across this campus, you have opportunities to serve from media to different impact teams everywhere. And I would encourage you. Uh, we were there in Texas for four years, uh, and while we were there, I had the opportunity to get to know a good friend of mine. On, his name was Chris, and he was, um, he's now a really good friend of mine. By the time we just met, and he was leaving to go to the mission field with his family as I was arriving. And so we had about six or eight months of overlap where we got to connect and got to know each other. And in 2010, Chris invited me to come to Kenya to help do some leadership development for a church that was there in Nairobi. And so I was excited to have the opportunity. You know, I'm going to go on safari. I'm going to have all these cool things. It's going to be amazing. And I showed up in Kenya and I was serving with that church. And one morning as I was praying and I was reading my Bible before, church, before the, the meetings were to start, God tapped me on the shoulder and he said, this is what you're going to be doing for me in the kingdom. And in that moment, I was so excited. You know, when you hear God speak almost audibly, it was almost an audible voice. It was that like powerful to me. I picked up the phone and I called my wife and she was holding our then six month old uh, boy who's now um, taller than she is. That picture was taken about three or four months ago and now Mason's taller than his mom. She was holding that six month old and I said, babe, we're supposed to be missionaries. And she was like, she had prayed, and God was bringing that dream from when she was 11 years old into fruition. It was the coolest thing. But you know, I have to tell you this. When she was 11 and she was praying, she said, God, I'll be a missionary anywhere you want me to go as long as it's not Africa. And now we're missionaries in Africa. That was 2010. I came back from that trip. It was April of 2010. I came back from that trip, and we prayed, and we fasted. We talked to our leaders, everything. Everything we knew to do, we were doing, and we were hearing over and over God saying, yes, but not yet. You might be here, and you might be saying, I know what God has called me to. I know what God has called me to walk in. I know what God has called me to live in, but I find myself right here, and I'm not there yet. I would encourage you, be faithful and take the next right step that is in front of you. And watch as you are faithful to do what God puts in front of you. God will open all the doors, and one day you will be walking in your dream like I am today. Amen? That's a, that's a word for someone right there. You, you could pretty much pack up and, and leave right now because that's what you needed to hear, and the Holy Spirit needed you to hear that today. That was 2010 in April. By August of that year, we were still praying, and we were asking God, and all of a sudden my phone rings, and it's Alton Garrison, the assistant general superintendent of the, all of the Assemblies of God, and he said, Scott, we would love for you to pray about coming 
and being our national director of children's ministry for the Assemblies of God here in the USA. My wife and I prayed, and we took the next right step. That door was open, and we walked in it. For three years, we served as the national directors of children's ministry. I promise you, I still cannot tell you exactly what my job description was, because I didn't know. But I got to travel around and meet really cool people like Pastor David and other leaders all over the country. I got to speak in camps. I got to be connected with children's pastors and children's leaders and all of this thing. And I didn't understand. At the end of, uh, at the end of that season, the end of the three years, I took another team of children's pastors. This time I was the one leading the trip. I took a team of children's pastors and we went to Kenya and I took my wife with me. And at that trip, while we were there, I could hear God clear as day saying, yes, but not yet. You're not ready yet. And I'm like, God, but it's right here in front of me. God said, not yet. So we came back. And a few months after coming back, we went back into the local church where we served for seven years at a church in Tucson, Arizona. It's slightly different than the climate here in South Dakota, as you can imagine. This outside, everyone, I saw some people wearing shorts. I see a lot of people wearing short sleeves. We're soaking up the sunlight. Amen? Right? We're enjoying it. Anybody else enjoying the weather? I have to let you know I have prayed and fasted for this weather. This weather is here because this Florida boy wasn't sure he could live in North and South Dakota for a full year while his daughter was at Bible college for her freshman year. And I said, God, I need the mildest winter ever in Jesus' name. And that's what I'm believing for because I know you all got dumped on. Here, that's how you know I'm from the south right there. Did you hear it, y'all? It sneaks out every once in a while. I know that you were dumped on with lots of snow last year, and I don't know if I can handle that snow uh, this year. So seven years, Tucson, Arizona, took another team of children's pastors in 2015. At the end of that trip, I literally took the dream because I heard God say again, not yet. I took the dream and I put it on a shelf because I said, God, I know that you would never call me to go to the mission field. You would never ask me to go to the mission field while I had teenagers living in my home. So I put the dream on a shelf. In 2018, I was serving as the executive pastor at that church, and we were, we were a fairly large church in Arizona, and we were considered a primary partner for several different organizations. And one of those organizations invited me as the executive pastor who oversaw all the missions. I was to go and tar be a part of a conference, is what they called it. They told me conference. That's why I'm doing Every time I tell this story, I'm like, un unintentionally, subconsciously, I just throw these conference. It was a prayer meeting. It wasn't a conference. We got around and we prayed together for three straight days. And I thought to myself, okay, I can pray for three straight days. I am a pastor. I should be able to pray for three straight days. So I powered through it. At the end of the time, it was all about Africa. Everything was about Africa. At the end of the time, the, guy, the, the pastor who was leading the entire event, he laid out a map on the floor that was about half the size of this room. It was huge. And he, it was a map of the continent of Africa. And he said, I need everyone to go and stand on a country. And subconsciously, I found myself, and a little bit consciously, I walked over and I stood in East Africa, right on the coast, underneath the seven that is Somalia, I stood on the, on the country of Kenya. That's how big the map was. I could stand, and the country was there. It was me. And I began to pray. And God began to stir in my heart all the dreams and the visions and the things that he had laid on my heart. And as I'm praying, the pastor, he began to conclude the time. He said, listen, God is doing something new on the continent of Africa. My heart starts to race. God's doing something big on the continent of Africa, and we need you. And at this point, I'm just, my heart is beating. Ever had those moments where you know the Holy Spirit speaking to you, and you're like, you can feel it? He said, we need you to start sending your best people. And I went, Whew. That was close, God. I thought that was the moment. I said, we've sent all these people to different countries around the continent of Africa. Thank you, God, that you're doing and will continue to send. And then he went on to say, and for someone in this room, you need to hear this. God is speaking directly to you, and he's saying this. He's saying, now is the time. Now is the time. In that moment, I broke. I began weeping. Probably all the people around me were like, oh, we know who God's speaking to, right? Right? But in that moment, I was weeping, and I said, as I'm, praying, as I'm praying under my breath, I said, God, I told her the last time, I need you to confirm this. I need you to speak directly to Sarah this time so that she can hear, because we're in a different season of life, a different time of life, and I believe that, God, you can confirm this in her if this is really you this time. 
That was September of 2018. I got back. My wife was the prayer pastor on staff, and she was over all the prayer ministry, and we had a season of prayer and fasting in January. And during that season of prayer and fasting, God was working on her, and she had begun to experience visions that she never experienced in her life before. God was speaking to her and giving her different pieces of this picture that were starting to come alive. At the end of the season of prayer and fasting, I walked up to my wife. We were in a prayer meeting, and I walked up to her because God was showing me. He was showing me that in 2010, I wasn't ready yet because he needed to take me to the national office so that he would allow us to have a network of supporters all across the country. And then I wasn't ready yet in 2015. He needed to take me to a local church where I could learn. Believe it or not, I as a pastor, even as a pastor at that time for 15 years, I still needed to learn how to fast. I still needed to learn how to hunger for the, the, the gifts of the Spirit. I needed to learn all of these things spiritually. And he took me to a local church where I could learn all of those things. And I went up to my wife, and I could tell she was in the back of the room, and she was crying. And I said, babe, we we have to talk. She looked up at me, and she said, yes, we need to talk. We went to my office, and I looked at her and said what any smart husband would say in that moment. I said, you first. (laughs) She said, "Uh uh-uh, not this time, you first. And so I began to tell her what God had showed me. How in 2010 it was this, in 2013 it was this, in 2015 it was this, and that now I felt like God was pushing us in this direction. And she said, I got the final piece of the vision, and she looked at me and she said these exact words. She said, I believe God is telling us now's the time. Exact same words. I had never said that to her before. She was saying, now is the time. Things fast forwarded really quick. We talked to our pastors, we talked to our leaders. And we filled out an application on August the 9th of 2019. They told me it would take three to six months for that application to be approved. Forty days later, we got a notice that we were approved, and here was our account number. It was exactly 40 days. It was amazing to see what God did over the course of the next six months. We were fully funded on March 10th of 2020. Some of you are piecing together some of the details of what happened around March of 2020. We were fully funded on March 10th. March 11th, we sold our house. It was on the market for about 16 hours. Sold, cash offer, closed on March 11th. March 12th, the entire world shut down for COVID. My kids were supposed to go to Disney World. This is the thing they were the most mad about. Grandma already had the tickets, already had everything lined up. She was taking them to Disney World. They were going to go to Florida and hang out for spring break. They landed on Saturday night. Disney closed on Sunday. Yeah, uh uh-huh, poor missionary kids. Just kidding. God was speaking to us and showing us. And in that season, he taught us that we even even then needed to slow down and rely on him. We needed to slow down and rely on him. Finally, the, the government of Kenya opened up the border. And on August the 8th, we were the third flight to go into Kenya. The third flight, they were still dressed in complete hazmat suits with the little blue booties and the blue gloves and the complete white with the screen that the flight attendants were. It was the craziest thing. Best part was the plane was completely empty, so that was awesome. You know, if you've flown internationally and you get a whole row to lay down in, that's spectacular. But we got there, and God began to allow us to be used as he has called us to be used. And now here we are three years later. We're back And we're in this crazy season of itineration where we're traveling around to different churches and we're sharing what God has called us to share to the church for this season. Today, as I was praying and I was preparing and even talking with with Pastor Gabe and and Pastor David as we were meeting, I feel like God is calling you crosswalk to a season of more. A season of more. That's what God is asking of you today. Today. That as you step into 2024, God is going to be asking of crosswalk to do more for the kingdom than you ever have before. More outreach, more inviting of friends, more generosity. God is calling you to so much more. And that is why, personally, as I'm sitting and I'm listening going, it makes sense. They have a meeting today, Serve 101. A meeting today for you to get to be a part of what God is doing so that when this season of more starts to hit and God starts to fill this place with people from all over this city that are coming to this city from all over the world, you're ready to receive them. Are you ready for a season of more, church? Are you ready? Let me pray and then we'll dive into God's word. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity that you have given me today. This opportunity to share with your people what it is you are calling us as your body to do in this world. 
God, I pray that you would anoint my lips today to speak. And Heavenly Father, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, where my words fall short, you would speak directly to hearts and spirits and lives today. And that your word would go forth in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. There are three words that we use a lot in children's ministry that I want us to focus on today. Um, There are three words whenever we would talk about BGMC, which is Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge, which is how children are encouraged to give to missions in our churches, Assemblies of God churches across the country, I should say. Uh, We use three words. Those three words are this, pray, give, and go. Pray, give, and go. We encourage kids to pray for the world around them, We ask them to give generously, and generosity, I have to tell you this, generosity is a posture. It's not a moment. You're not generous in the moment. You have a posture in your life of living generously. And we want kids to give, and then we ask them to prayerfully consider going. But as I said, God has a big plan, and we're in a new season. God has given us a dream In the Africa House, that's what we call all the missionaries that live across the continent of Africa. In the Africa House, we've been given a dream that one day we would see a healthy church within walking distance of every single African. A healthy church within walking distance of every single African. Whether they are in the Ivory Coast or they are in Kenya, whether they are in uh, South Africa or Lesotho or any of those countries all across the continent, we want to see a healthy church. Amen? A church where people can go and they can learn about the love of Jesus. But if we're going to see that plan come true, then we're going, as a church, we're going to need to do more. Everybody say more. A little bit louder. Everybody say more. Say it so the people on the stream can hear your voices. One more time. More. That's right. Hopefully somebody's sitting in front of a screen and they just yelled more. Right? God wants us to do more. He wants us to do more for the kingdom than we ever have before. The first is this. If you're taking notes, write this down. God is asking us to pray more. Pray more. Every time I think of praying more, I think of my friend, Pastor Tim. Pastor Tim is a Maasai man who has planted a church. This is a picture of him and his wife, his beautiful wife, Esther. Not pictured are his two girls um, that are just amazing. They're they're beautiful little girls, um, and it's so much fun to be with them. Pastor Tim and his wife, Esther, they're some of our best friends. And even though we've now been in the States for six months, we're still texting back and forth uh, almost weekly that we text back and forth with them because they're just, they're just great people, and I love the joy and the energy uh, that they bring. But Pastor Tim is a Maasai. 35 years ago, the Maasai were considered an unreached people group meaning that a room this size with this group of people in here, we would be hard-pressed to find a single person that knew someone that knew about Jesus. They were unreached. Less than 1% of the entire Maasai community was saved. And Pastor Tim is now one of the many that are planting churches amongst the Maasai. It's an incredible story of God's just supernatural intervention, uh, literally sending, sending two Maasai guys all over the country of Kenya to come in contact finally with a missionary that would commit to coming to them. And now the Maasai are the fastest growing part of the Kenya Assemblies of God. In Pastor Tim's district, he's the district children's director, meaning he's responsible for the children's ministry in the district. In his district alone, in 2022, we planted 60 new churches. 60 new churches. It's amazing what God is doing amongst the Maasai. And Pastor Tim, Pastor Tim, when he felt led to plant a church, he went to his bishop. He, he knelt before his bishop and he asked permission. He said, may I please have the blessing to go? He was submitted to his leadership and they said yes, laid the hands on his head and blessed him. That is what is done in the Maasai community, to give a blessing. A hand went on his head and the bishop said, go to this area. And Pastor Tim began to pray. Every morning at 6 a.m., he walked to the tree where he would plant Parkview KAG. And he began to pray every day. It was dangerous. I'll be honest with you. It was dangerous. He had to navigate lions and leopards, not things that you usually have on your commute to church, right? He had to navigate hippopotamus, which are the deadliest and most dangerous animals. So as you're singing this holiday season, all you want is a hippopotamus for Christmas, Think, really think carefully about what you're asking for, all right? Because they will run you over in a heartbeat. 
but he had to navigate all these things. And he had to navigate kneeling at the base of this tree, hiding in the bushes so the chief and the witch doctor in that part of the Mara wouldn't know that he was there preparing to plant a church. But he said, I felt like I was supposed to pray until God told me to stop. So for six months, every day, he prayed. After prayer, he would go, God, where would you have me go today? And on his way home, he would go and share the gospel with a different family. At the end of six months, God released him to start the church. And they had their first Sunday where they gathered together under the tree, and they had church together. Pastor Tim said, in that moment, I looked out and I saw that every single person that was there under the tree, I had personally led them to Jesus. That's what it's all about. Right there. Lives that were changed. Not, not people who were coming over from another church, but people who were brand new believers. One Sunday, they showed up at church, the tree. They showed up at their tree, and they noticed that something had happened. In this part of the world, they are very concerned about witch doctors and the demonic. And when they looked and saw that their tree had been knocked down by an elephant, it was a moment where the people in the church weren't sure what to do. But Pastor Tim said, I stood up on the tree. He reenacted it for us so we could take a picture to share this with you. My son Mason is in the back. You can tell he's really excited about this moment in life. He's a 13-year-old boy. He's all right. He said, I stood on the tree and I reminded my people. Jesus told us to build this church, and Jesus said in his word that he would build the church, and the gates of hell would not stand against it. They, they, he said, there's another tree right there. We're going to meet there next Sunday. Next Sunday they met there. They met there, and they had service there until now they are in a building that is beautiful. Two weeks ago, three weeks, three weeks ago now, they just put concrete down on the floors. They had the walls going up. They had the roof. Now they've got concrete. They've got three classrooms where they have a school. They just graduated about 60 kids from their school. It's the coolest thing. Funny, funny add-on to the story, that other tree has also been knocked down by an elephant now. Elephants are an issue in that part of Kenya, okay? Elephants are an issue anywhere they're at, but that's a different story, okay? My favorite part about going and preaching at Parkview is when I look out, I see the people jumping. I see the people dancing. I'm excited to, to be in the presence of God. There are over 200 people that call Parkview Assembly of God, their Kenya Assembly of God, their home now, their home church. And my favorite part is when I step outside those doors, I look around at a nice fence that goes all the way around the property that won't let the elephants in anymore. Amen? Some of you, you might have dreams and you might have desires and the enemy has come along and he's used his elephants. Maybe that's other people. Maybe that's life circumstances. And they have knocked down your dreams. Remember, if God has put it on your heart, he is faithful and he is able and he will take you where you need to go. Don't, don't, don't allow the small attacks of the enemy to become huge in your life. Amen? I didn't say that in first service, so that's for somebody right here that you needed to hear that today. We have to pray, just like Pastor Tim, for six months faithfully, six to eight hours a day he would pray. We have to be willing to pray more. There are 867 unreached people groups in the 48 countries that make up sub-Saharan Africa. That's roughly 316 million people that don't have an adequate presentation of the gospel. They don't have a way to hear someone preaching. Jesus said, the fields are white. They're ready for harvest. We are to pray that God would send laborers into the harvest. Amen, church? We need you to pray more. There's a, there's a, 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 a mission that is happening off the coast of East Africa. It's a small little island. I can't say the name of the, the country because we have workers who are there that are serving, that have served faithfully for 20 years, but they're not there as missionaries. They're there as part of being uh, teachers in a, in a program but they're there to share the gospel. And for 20 years, they went without seeing a convert. And now, a few years ago, one man gave his heart to Jesus. Amen? This Sunday, when they gathered together, there are seven of them. The seven brothers came together for church. In their culture, where there was no church, now there's a church. Against threat of persecution like you could not imagine. Their family members have tied them up and taken them out into the ocean in a small boat and thrown them into the ocean. They've been poisoned. They've been threatened. They've been attacked. They've been beaten. When we ask them, one of the, one of the workers there asked them, what would you have the American church do for you? You know what they said? 
They didn't ask for resources. They didn't ask for money. They didn't ask for a way out. They said, please ask the American church to pray more. Would you pray more that people all over the world would come to know Jesus? Number two, we need to give more. Everybody say give more. Give more. We don't need to just give more of our finances, though. See, in America, we, we do this thing where we, we, we treat uh, our giving just like we do a lot of other things in life where it's like another bill that we're supposed to just write a check and drop it in the offering and, and keep, it, keep it going. Is it important? Yes, without a doubt. We could not do what we do in East Africa, and missionaries all around the world honestly couldn't do what is done all over the world if it wasn't for the giving that happens on a week-in and week-out basis. So I say thank you for your generosity when you tithe. Not just when you give in an offering when a missionary comes, but your tithing, your giving above and beyond your tithe enables your pastor and the team here to support missionaries like my family. But I believe God is calling us to give more, not just more of our finances, but more of our time and more of our energy than we ever have before. He's calling us to a new season. He's calling us to do something incredible for him. I want to take you now in a video and show you an example of someone who is willing to give more. And, to be honest, to a place where your giving has already made a difference. Because I know, I know that churches all across the country sometimes give and they don't always see how their giving makes a difference. But let me take you to Turkana. This is Turkana. And this is a video that's playing. It's just my iPhone holding uh, on the front dash of a land cruiser. But this is Turkana where it is a very difficult place to live. You'll see uh, some grass huts on either side of the road. Those are people's homes. And here in Turkana, when I was there, it had not rained for three years. Three years without a drop of rain. Imagine living like this with no rain. They live off crops that they're able to grow, and they live by the animals that they're able to raise. So for three years, those two things were very, very difficult for the people of Turkana to do. But my friend, Pastor David, felt called to plant a church in Turkana. This is a picture of Pastor David. You can see there's a smile on his face and a joy in his life that only comes from Jesus. Because he lives right out there in the middle of that desert. And now he has planted a church. When he first planted the church in Turkana, as he, was, he felt led to do, he went and he planted this church. And the craziest thing happened. The chief and the witch doctor got together. And they told everyone in the community, Pastor David's church is the reason why it is not raining here. So they got their rocks and their stones and they gathered a crowd of people and they ran Pastor David off into the wilderness. He said, I walked, he said, Missionary Scott, I walked for what is the equivalent of three miles, about five kilometers, I walked into the desert until I came to a spot where I was, found myself under a tree and the Holy Spirit said, start the church here. He said, I looked up and I told God, there are no people. Pastor David's pretty smart. You can't have church, God, without a people. Because it was just dry desert everywhere. No homes, not even the thatched homes. Nothing was there. God said, do you trust me? And are you willing to give everything for what I'm calling you to do? So he started the church there. That Sunday, it was him and his wife and his family. But little by little, people started moving into that area. And Pastor David was partnered with us as a mission. And because of your giving, we were able to supply food. You see, I'm going to show another picture very quickly of people in Turkana that are hurting. This is what the people of Turkana look like. And this, over to the, the, the left of the screen, is one of our, our workers that we partner with with an organization called Convoy of Hope, and we were able to bring in food and supplies to Pastor David, and he began to pass them out. You guys can take that picture off and put the picture of Pastor David back up. He was able to, to pass those supplies out because people in America were living generously. People in America were saying, it's not enough for me just to, to thank God. I have to respond, and I have to help others, and I have to live a life of generosity. And that, because of that, there's now a church that is there. I was actually there to celebrate the, uh, the, the grand opening of a new church building. The coolest part of this story, my favorite part, in his broken Swahili and my broken Swahili, because I'm truthfully not even that good at English yet, um, we were talking, and he said, missionary, one day we came to church, 
and we noticed that a long line had been drawn in the sand. It was a trench. And we noticed it came right to our tree, and out of the ground was coming a pipe with a faucet on it. A, non- a non-governmental organization, and I couldn't understand exactly what organization it was or anything like that, had decided years in advance that they were going to run a water line right to there. And it just showed up one day. Now everyone in the community, you know where they go for food? They go to Pastor David's church. You know where they go for water? They go to Pastor David's church. Where there was no life, now there is life. Where there was no church building, they were just under the tree. Now we are celebrating. Go ahead and play that video. You can play the next one. You can hear them singing. You can hear them rejoicing. You can hear them celebrating. The goodness of God is what they're singing about. Because that's why I got to go that day. That's why I got to be a part of that day, was to see out in the middle of the desert where there was no one. Now, everywhere you looked in a complete 360, there were thousands of people that were living there that had gone closer and closer and closer to the church. Where there was no people, now there's people. Where there was no life, now there's life abundantly. Where there was no hope, the church came in. God came in through generosity of people just like you and your generosity, truthfully, and made an impact right there. In Kenya we've got to give more creatively one of the ways that we're giving more creatively in Kenya most of the boys and girls meet under the tree show the next picture they meet under the tree just like that that's the church in the background the church has finally raised enough funds they've built a church but they have nowhere for their children to meet so the children meet outside like this when Maya our now 16 year old heard this at 12 years old she heard about this and 13 she said I have to do something daddy Especially in the Mara, that's what she said. I want to do something in the Mara. That's where Pastor Tim's church is. She said, I want to do something in that part of Kenya. I feel like God is telling me to. So for a project in school, she decided she was going to raise about $2,000 to build a children's church structure. This is what a children's church structure looks like, this next one. It's not anything elaborate. It's just poles that go up. We would call it here in America, we would call it like a pole barn. There's a roof and there's poles that come down into the ground. She said, Daddy, I feel like I'm supposed to do this. She started for this project at school. Some of the kids were learning how to ride a skateboard. Others were learning, like, how to sing a song. My daughter was learning how to change the lives of little boys and girls in Kenya. But proud dad, mo- proud dad moment, okay? It was really cool. She started doing this. And a few people started emailing me. They heard about what she was doing. She created this whole social media campaign. And $14,000 later, she had raised enough to build seven of these structures, now, God is using that, that, that moment and that momentum, amen? Now we have built 50 of these structures, and we're believing that when we go back, we're going to continue, and there's going to be a day when there's every single church, there's a place for boys and girls to hear about Jesus, amen? That's what it's all about. And the young people, the next generation, one of the things that is happening in Kenya, some of you may or may not know, uh, but all across Africa, especially East Africa, the National Basketball Association, the NBA, you guys have heard of the NBA, right? They are dumping millions and billions of dollars into Africa because they understand that the future of the world economy is in Africa. Okay? They're doing it for financial reasons. But because of that, basketball is becoming huge, and there are communities where there's People and and young people especially, young men and women that love basketball that have nowhere to play. So we partnered with a local church, uh, East Assembly of God in Buruburu, which is just outside of Nairobi, and we built this brand new basketball court. When it went in, it was the nicest outdoor court in Nairobi. Now, just literally minutes ago, I showed my phone to uh, Pastor David as we were sitting there during worship. I said, look, here's the second one. The second one has just been completed, and they're looking to dedicate it in the next week or so so they can start. The coolest thing is this isn't just a place for people to go play basketball. It's a place for people to come find Jesus. The first day we opened it, we had two salvations, two young people that gave their heart to Jesus. Amen? Since then... Since then, almost every day, we have 30 to 50 people that are on this court. We've had had those who are part of the Muslim faith convert to Christianity because they couldn't believe there was a place that loved and cared about them enough to provide an atmosphere and an environment where they could come and play basketball. And now a pastor meets them and greets them. There's discipleship that is taking place. It's so awesome. We have to be willing to give more. We need you. Missionaries, when I'm speaking for all the missionaries that this church partners with and represents and beyond that, we need you, church. We need you to pray more, and we need you to give more than you ever have before. And I'd invite the worship team to come now. 
Because there's one more thing that we need to ask of you, and that is we need you to go more. We need you to go more. You might be here and you might be saying, I, I don't think I can go to Africa. I promise, I sat in that chair. I am very familiar with that chair. I sat in that chair in my own office, and I said to Jesus, I said, Jesus, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to give you everything, but I don't know about my babies. I've heard too many horror stories, Jesus, about kids who are my kids' age that when they step out and they go to the mission field, they give up their faith and they walk away from God, and I don't want that. I love your world, Jesus, but you called me to pastor these three kids, just as Pastor even said, first and foremost, with Pastor Levi, he's coming in, yes, to be the children's pastor, but you are the primary discipler of your child. Your child is going to watch what you do, and they're going to they're see the model, and they're going to follow the example. And I said, Jesus, I'm not ready to give up these three. I'm not ready to lay them on the altar, Jesus. And he said to me this. He said, don't rob them of their destiny. Don't rob them of what they've called, I've called them to do. His exact words to me, that's what he told my wife, don't rob them of their destiny. His exact words to me was, you think you love them more than I do? You think your plans for them are better than my plans? You might be here and you might say, I don't, even with all that missionary, I hear what you're saying, preach it, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not called to go. Not all of us are. We're not all called to go to another country. But if you are a follower of Jesus, you are called to go and make disciples of all nations. And that includes the people that live across the street from you. And you might not have the same calling as me to go across the seas, but I promise that each and every one of us is called to a minimum go across the street to share the love of Jesus with those who are lost and are hurting. And they're just as lost as the people who I showed you on the screen before they found Jesus. They're just as lost as I was until I found Jesus. God is calling each of us to go. You might be here and you might say, I don't even know where to start. How do I, how do I like, give more? How do I pray more? How do I? It's an easy step for you. All you got to do is walk out that door. This is exit right there. Turn to the left a little bit and participate in the meeting that starts today. For some of you, you know, though. God's been telling you you're supposed to speak to a coworker, and you've been afraid to do it. Now's the time to step out in faith, just like I said at the beginning of this message, to take the next right step. And if you'll do your part, he'll do his part, and you'll see God do the miraculous, the miraculous, the thing you thought was never possible. That coworker or that boss or that person that you are going to school with, whoever it is, God wants to use you to reach them.